Welcome to the 40th Annual Preaching with Power, sponsored by the Urban Theological Institute of United Lutheran Seminary. For 40 years, our seminary has hosted this annual spring event, bringing to our community the finest in African-American preaching. And on tonight, Bishop Yvette Flunder, pastor of the City of Refuge, United Church of Christ in Oakland, California, and presiding bishop of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries is our preacher. As you celebrate preaching with power with us, we ask that you consider a donation to one of our scholarship funds. Information on how to give will be shown on the screen following the sermon. Uh, but if you do miss that, feel free to reach out to us here at the Urban Theological Institute, what we call UTI, our office here on our Philadelphia campus, or you can always mail a gift made out to the seminary to the attention of UTI and our Philadelphia campus. Now, we will have greetings from Bishop Patricia Davenport of the Southeast Pennsylvania Senate of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Following her, we will have greetings from the president of our seminary, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin. Then following our president, the Reverend Sean James, Associate Conference Minister for Congregational Development of the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference of the United Church of Christ, a member of the United Lutheran Seminary Board of Trustees will introduce our preacher, followed by a sermonic selection from Scott Cumberbatch, and then you will hear our preacher for this evening, Bishop Yvette Flunder. Greetings, beloved siblings in Christ. Grace, peace, power, and love in the name of the one who can do all things but fail, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. What a joy and privilege to gather in sacred cyberspace. Praise the Lord for preaching with power. Thank you, Dr. Robertson, the Urban Theological Institute, United Lutheran Seminary, board, faculty, student, and alumni for your ongoing support of this spirit-filled, life-giving learning opportunity for us all. I would be remiss if I did not say thank you to ULS President Guy Irwin, our ally, in lifting black theologians from across the country on this platform. We are honored on what would be considered Lutheran night to have Bishop Yvette Flanders, woman of God that for years I have admired from afar. We are so grateful to have you participate as one of our historic black women preachers tonight. Hallelujah. I want you to know I have my shouting shoes on. Tonight we worship. Tonight we celebrate our soon returning king. Mm. Yes, beloved. This is our opportunity to listen, learn, and worship. It is also an opportunity to financially support the Urban Theological Institute. Yes, Dr. Q, our Senate check for $500 is in the mail, and my personal donation of $500 has been given electronically. I would like to invite all my siblings in Christ from across the country to lean into this opportunity to make a difference in theological education. Join me to worship, to celebrate, and to give financially. Now, may the Holy Spirit be your strength, your guide, and your hope in the days ahead. Amen. God bless you. I'm Dr. Guy Irwin, president of United Lutheran Seminary, and it is a great privilege for me to be able to add a personal introduction and welcome to our preacher for today, Bishop Yvette Flunder. I don't know Bishop Yvette closely, but I have known of her for a long time. And twice in my life, her career and mine have intersected. We've presented on the same program at two events over the last few years. One, a specialized gathering for LGBTQIA plus seminarians and pastors. And later, in a gathering for the clergy of two of our ELCA California synods. I come to know her work well because she made such a deep impression on me in those events and was 
And what she had to say about the power of the Spirit in our lives together as church has helped shape my understanding of what it means to be church together. Let me express my great joy that Bishop Yvette Flunder is with us in this program. I hope that you will be as blessed as I am by what we are to hear. I've titled this sermon, Freedom Food. 
subtitle is, We Were Once Full Slaves. I'll be reading from Exodus 16, 1 through 3. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. One month and 15 days after leaving Egypt, Israel entered into a tract between Elam and Sinai. It seems they brought enough food from Egypt in the telling of this story to last for a month and a half. They had been delivered from hundreds of years of great trial and tribulation, from great suffering at the hand of hard taskmasters. They had seen the mighty hand of Jehovah work on their behalf, working through signs and wonders in the earth and in the heavens. While being caught up in the wonder of it all, they didn't consider the perishable nature of their food combined with the length of the journey and the inevitable that they would indeed be hungry again. Kind of like how you feel after an incredible holiday supper and you didn't bring some Tupperware. You will, by the way, be hungry again. The excitement of freedom can only satiate your appetite for a time. Because with freedom comes certain new and unanticipated responsibilities. How would they satisfy their hunger in their newfound freedom land? There had been a paradigm shift. The way they had gotten their food previously was suddenly and no longer available to them. The food was poor perhaps, but it was available to them. They did not plan for not having food. They were not skilled in the ways of the wilderness outside of Egypt because they had been born in Egypt and they were not accustomed to trusting Jehovah God for food. They had long looked to their oppressors for sustenance. And when hunger hit them, the celebration of their freedom began to pale. They forgot the oppression of Egypt and they immediately desired the old remedies to their hunger. They did not fully realize that they were a new people. They were now the people of the crossing, the people of the Exodus, a new people under a new covenant on their way to a new land. And there was no going back. In fact, old things were not an option anymore. The question then and the question now, my beloved, how does a free person dispense with a slave's appetite? Or how can we free ourselves from the vestiges of bondage, even in the land that purports to be a land of freedom? When African-American slaves in this country heard about Massa Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of Freedom, whether on time or on Juneteenth, I am certain they danced and they shouted and they rejoiced and probably for days on end until they realized the infrastructure that had been their lives so long had crumbled. They'd been born in slavery. And now the big houses were being burned and the Confederate dollar was worthless and there was no place to call home. Many had made no plans for their survival outside of slavery or for the future of their children. Pulling two or 300 pounds of cotton and tobacco and wet nursing Mrs. Baby, servicing Massa's needs. 
cooking, cleaning, and animal husbandry did not afford them the privilege to sit down and ponder their future or set long-term goals. Many of my people did not learn freedom skills, independent life skills, coping skills, self-esteem skills, self-governing skills, money management skills. These were not things learned in slavery. Most endured earth and looked toward heaven for their reward. For many who continue to endure, it is still about wondering if it is even prudent to demand and expect freedom. The four parents of the Europeans in this country came here fleeing religious and political oppression with high hopes and aspirations, perhaps in a quest for writing those desired freedoms into law. These once oppressed did not seem to realize that in order for we the people to be a statement of freedom for all, it must include First Nations people and later Asian people and African people and all who would also immigrate to this land. But the hunger for power forgot the pain of past rejection and exile. You see, the hunger for power is almost insatiable. The hunger for power forgets and is often humbled only temporarily by difficulty. And when the hunger returns, the oppressed often mimic their oppressors. You see, it's one thing to come to a new land, but it's quite another to begin to have a different appetite, both for the slave and for the slave older, both for the slave and for the slaveholder. A new appetite, the appetite in slavery cannot be the same as the appetite in freedom. African-Americans ate food low on the hog, pig feet, hog moss, chitlins, because that was all we could get. And we loaded ourselves down with butter and cream and fried foods when we could and sweets when we could, but then we were pulling 300 pounds of cotton in the sun. Now, if we continue a diet of soul food like that daily, we will break our scales. Our cholesterol and diabetes and high blood pressure and heart trouble will shoot through the roof. God changed the scenario and God changed Israel's menu and God changed Egypt's labor class. And God gave Israel what they needed for the journey. And Egypt had to make it by making their own bricks in order to go on to the promise. Israel had to pass through a wilderness and had to eat a different diet. They had to change their palate. They had to hunger for different things. And they had to pray a different prayer. They had to go from the Freedom March and the Freedom Miracles to actually living free. And now that we are free, what is our plan for our newfound freedom? Hear me today, beloved. We will not emerge from this pandemic the way we came into it. Jobs will shift. Priorities will shift. Relationships will shift. Educational institutions will shift. Our bodies will shift. The value and desire for luxury items will shift. Religion will experience one of the greatest reformations in history. But stop longing for what we have been delivered from and focus on what we have been delivered to. When you get free from jail, remember you can still hunger for the things that sent you there if you don't appreciate your freedom. When you get free from a bad relationship, remember you are vulnerable to rebound to a worse one if you don't appreciate your freedom. When you get free from drugs and other substances, remember you can exchange one addiction for another one if you don't appreciate your freedom. When you seek freedom from harboring judge judgment and prejudice or racism, you may suffer the loss of some friends and you may find yourself disinvited 
and the desire to pick it up, pick up what? Your privilege may tempt you to relapse if you don't appreciate your freedom. What did God feed Israel in the freedom land? Manna. That's the word. A word that actually means, what is this? I think that's a perfect name. It's food for the journey, beloved, just enough so we can travel light and depend on God for what's next. For we are on a journey. Marching to Zion, my old folks used to say, beautiful, beautiful Zion. It was enough food, proper food, healthy food, daily bread, and God fixed it so that they would have to trust God every morning. Like the song says, great is God's faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercy I see. And all that you've needed, God, all that I've needed, God, your hand has constructed and provided. I'm grateful for it. I'll take care of it and depend on you to sustain it and move me into my promised land. Let's pray together. God of all power and strength, we pray what our ancestors prayed. We need you to work a wonder. God who governs angel armies, encamp round about us and give us justice favor. God who is before us and behind us, beside us and inside of us, hear our earnest and fervent prayers today. Just as you did for those who cried out to you from slave ships, under the skin mutilating lash, from dungeons and cotton and tobacco fields, our mothers who bore the smell of Massa's bedroom, from sweatshops and the prison industrial complex and the streets of our cities where we are still running for our lives. We are here because we believe in the God of good religion. And we are here on behalf of the underpaid and the underemployed. And we are here on behalf of the housing and food insecure and for the rights of all people to vote in free and fair elections. We are here praying and working for the rights of black and brown people to cease to be disproportionately killed by those who our taxes pay to protect and serve. We are here to advocate that the multiple millions of dollars used to protect the unborn be exceeded by funds needed and allocated to care for the born. We are here holding up the hearts of the LGBTQI community as the suffering and the community exile and the constant barrages of weaponized politics and religion surround us. We pray for an end to these endeavors that seek to create laws and institutions of shame for so many right here in the land of the free and the home of the brave. We are right here, God. We are right here, Jesus of Nazareth, where you would be. We are right here with the memories of Martin King and Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And now, as our elders would say, great God undertake for us in every particular. Give us political strategy beyond our experience and training. Give us eyes to see the tricks and the plans designed to be hidden from our eyes. Speak to the minds of our elected officials chosen to serve us. Remind them that they are charged to serve the needs of the whole citizenry of this nation and not to covet what fills their coffers with blood money. Great God, we stand in need of prayer today against any and every intent to use the God of all flesh as a bludgeon to defeat equality, fairness, access, and justice for every child of God. Now strengthen us as we come through this wilderness. Strengthen us for the days to come as we continue to push back against the all out attack of spiritual wickedness in high places. Open the closed doors, God creator and sustainer, stay the hand of injustice, rebuke the devourer of equality in every place and every form. 
and let the angel armies of justice encamp round about us. We pray, amen, and praise God. Thank you for joining us. And now I invite you to share a gift as you are moved by God's spirit to support our students who are studying and preparing for ministry. On the screen are ways that you can give both online and via US mail. Our main scholarship that supports all of our students in the Black Church concentration is the JQ Jackson Scholarship. We ask that you consider a gift to that fund, but you also have an opportunity to support students who are members of the Church of God in Christ through the Bishop Ernest C. Moore Scholarship Fund, and then African-American students who are members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America through the Grover and Irma Wright Scholarship Fund. I have made this request to our alumni this year, and so I ask our friends and all who are watching to give above your normal gifts this year. At least consider $40 above that amount that you normally would give in light of our 40th annual Preaching with Power. And so as you consider a gift, I thank you in advance for your gift and your support for our seminarians who are preparing for ministry. And please know that this gift is both temporal and eternal because when you invest in a seminary, you invest in ministry.